And we are pleased to have you back from our break, ladies and gentlemen of the listening audience. You're listening to The Crimson Pill with Antonin Fiore, uh, hosted by bbsradio.com on station number two. We are joined today by uh, the, like I say, folks, one of the one of the voices in the fields of research along the lines of inquiry that so much of our BBS radio listening audience uh, is fascinated by. One of the voices that uh, I have uh, just an incredible amount of respect and regard for, and that, of course, is Dr. Brooks Agnew. Now, we have left off by setting the stage uh, by way of our discussion about comets Elenin and Comet Honda making their pass through our solar system neighborhood, uh, reaching their closest points to our sun and then later to our Earth in the windows of uh, September and October of this fall to come. And we had transitioned our discussion into this explosive set of announcements, releases of information that have been made by NASA over the course of the last eight weeks. And of course, you'll recall also Dr. Agnew sharing with us the information of some internal communication at NASA uh, that uh, makes a person a little curious about uh, their, their uh, urgency and or their decision to, to make those sort of uh, statements now. We'd left off referencing an article, uh, an, a release on NASA.gov dated 18th of May uh, of this year, just about a month ago. Free floating planets may be more common than stars. We'd left off there. And uh, we're going to continue our journey using NASA.gov documents as well as Space.com uh, releases uh, as we explore this issue. But, you know, I'm already thinking about our friends in Missouri once again, the skeptics, the show me state. They're, they're kind of wondering, well, you know, this stuff, if, if what Dr. Agnew says about the internal communications to employees at NASA, if that's true, why uh, would not we see more activity? Why would NASA only... Uh, warn, quote-unquote, or inform, uh, perhaps more, more appropriately, their internal audiences in this way, but not do so similarly to the population as a whole. And this is where I'd like to uh, uh, draw back a connecting point to anyone who was uh, with our program last week and uh, our, our featured guest last week, uh, internationally recognized author, uh, lecturer, researcher Jordan Maxwell. At one point in our conversation, we discussed the subject that NASA itself is not what we think it is. Many people are unaware, and I would point your attention to perhaps Richard Hoagland and Mike Barra's book, Dark Mission, for a, a, a much, much more thorough uh, exposition of the subject matter. But NASA itself is not what we think it is. We've been told uh, right along that it's a civilian space program, when in reality it was chartered, it was created as a Department of Defense program. And yes, over the course of time, NASA has been reclassified as a civilian space program, but that did not come to pass and make its way through uh, our Congress until such time as the Department of Defense had already finalized its own top secret space program that they could continue doing the work that they had initially considered uh, essential for the, the DOD extension. And what does that really mean? What's the significance of that knowledge? Well, by definition, the most significant, most important, most impactful findings of NASA throughout its lifetime, its existence to date, please keep in mind, the most significant findings are immediately regarded as classified, top secret. Why would they share with the rest of the world who has not paid for these toys and salaries and research, why share with them for free what we have had to pay dearly for, and further, we all know how our government so casually and recklessly uses the notion of national security to disclose things that are the farthest from it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, both of those sets of reasons apply to this type of information. Uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping that through the course of our continued conversation, we'll cover some of those details as well. Uh, Dr. Agnew, are, are you with us here on the line again? Yes, I'm still here. And I apologize for my lengthy monologue there, sir, but uh, any thoughts for us here at, at, at this stage? Uh, I know that your track of research is, is running parallel to my own, and, and we haven't had a great opportunity to, to kind of coordinate, but uh, some reaction or your thoughts here at this stage before we kind of launch into this last piece? Well, you touch on something, you know, really uh, poignant, powerful. Uh, when I grew up, you know, I was fascinated with the space program. I was fascinated with President Kennedy's very bold 
uh, challenge that we were going to put a man on the moon in that decade, and in fact, we did. Um, and as I was getting out of high school, the lunar program was ended, and I mean ended suddenly. We had two completely funded, built, trained teams, backup teams, and equipment ready to go to the moon. But they did not go to the moon. They just ended the program. The space race was over. Russia didn't go to the moon. China didn't go to the moon. Nobody went to the moon after that. And we saw about 15,000 civilian civilian brains dumped onto the market. Of course, they filtered down into all the way to the junior college level, and, and probably the next generation of students benefited from it. But you're exactly right. The militarization of space began at that point. Instead of civilians filling those key positions in NASA, they were military personnel filling those key positions in NASA. As the space shuttle program was developed, its backup was developed, the X-37B. Well, NASA ran out of funding. How does that happen? Well, Congress cuts it off. And so the X-37B program was abandoned, but it was almost immediately picked up by the Air Force, uh-huh. and, and brand new funding was pumped into it, and it was elevated to what's called the Rapid Deployment Program. We still cannot get, even through the Freedom of Information Act, how much money was spent on the X-37B program. Mm. It, was, it was launched with a payload. We have no idea what was on it. It was sent up into space for a nine-month mission, which was cut short for some reason. It changed orbits unannounced. And it was only because diligent uh, telescope viewers were able to find it in space and report regularly on its location, watching its every move over free space. The rest of the world was watching it but wasn't reporting on it. And then it came back to Earth and safely landed. And it's getting ready to go back up again as a complete military program. Yes. So so you're exactly right. Military money, military leadership, and, of course, the military cloak of secrecy over the entire thing. Yes, yes. And I think think one additional layer of of reality check for an average, uh, you know, member of the the American public, uh, an average citizen, one more layer of reality check to this notion. You had mentioned that that with this new uh, newest craft, that uh, even utilizing Freedom of Information Act, uh, uh, you know, measures, uh, that the information is unavailable. And what I think is ironic is that even if it were available, let's say our Freedom of Information Act requests uh, produced a lot of documentation about the project. Let's keep uh, something uh, in mind in terms of perspective. Uh, on September 10th of 2001, at that time, uh, at the time, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld had made a press release uh, at a press conference, had made an announcement disclosing that the Department of Defense was unable to track $2.3 trillion in spending. That is not to say that it was somehow stolen, hijacked, missing in that sense. Uh, simply that they were unable to track it, and yet, folks, the real reason for a great deal of that is the black ops spending. The the spending that goes straight into black programs right off the budget. But ladies and gentlemen, 2.3 trillion, with a T, as in Thomas, dollars, that's uh, uh, it's on the order of one-fifth, just a little bit smaller than one-fifth of what our current national debt is. And well, now there, there's something else. There's something else to consider here too. The congressional team that was put together to investigate this and and literally drill into Rumsfeld as he testified before Congress was led by none other than Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh-huh. By all accounts, by all accounts, the most incompetent Congressperson in Washington. There was no real effort to find out. What happened to this money? Right. Quite right. Quite right and just so. Well, uh, at this stage, folks, uh, listening audience, at, at 20 after the hour here on uh, the Crimson Pill, now we turn to page two 
the rest of the story. We've got uh, additional NASA.gov documents, space.com uh, releases, and uh, supporting the May 18th release from NASA.gov that we were disclosing earlier, uh, also dated 18th of May on space.com, the headline, Lonely Rogue Worlds Surprisingly Outnumber Planets with Suns, where they go into uh, a good deal more depth about some of the uh, projections, estimations that they've made about some of these rogue planets. Uh, unfortunately, with, with time constraints, I'll need to leave that to your own path of research and inquiry, because what we really need to do is get to two more of these pieces. Uh, uh, dated April 19, 2011, uh, from once again from space.com, the headline, Some Alien Planets May Be Like Saturn's Moon Titan. Now, uh, Dr. Agnew, I'm not sure if your recent research has kind of had you visiting this, this notion about uh, the moon Titan of Saturn, uh, but if so, uh, any thoughts here about uh, what, what that means, the, the, excuse me, the significance of the headline that some alien planets may be like Saturn's moon Titan? Well, one of the unique things about Titan is that we, we've realized for a long, long time that Titan had volcanic activity. It was spewing things out into space and was, you know, partly responsible for the rings around Saturn. But it was recently discovered that the actual volcanoes were geysers. Underneath the surface of Titan is water. And yes. that's one of the unique things about Titan. Quite right, quite right. Um, as a matter of fact, if I begin to uh, pull some information from this article, uh, it leads, alien planets in orbit around red dwarfs and even rogue planets with no stars to call home might have surface oceans loaded with organic compounds. That's surface oceans even, making them similar to Saturn's moon Titan, a new study suggests, which which, folks, I find it interesting that they said surface oceans here, not oceans that lie underneath a frozen and or encrusted surface. I wonder if that's uh, not by mistake. Uh, further into the article, such alien uh, planets, excuse me, such alien, eh, in fact, I'm going to back up a little. Titan is the only known moon that has a thick atmosphere and the only world besides Earth to have liquid on its surface. The seas of Titan are made of liquid methane, often leading to speculation as to whether or not they could host life, much like how life on Earth depends on water. Such aliens could consume organic compounds just as Earth life does, but inhale hydrogen gas in place of oxygen and exhale methane instead of carbon dioxide, as, again, we do here on Earth. Uh, then it's followed by a quote from researcher Christopher McKay, a planetary scientist at NASA Ames Research Center, is, quote, astrobiology has historically focused on liquid water as the habitable liquid. And certainly it works well on Earth, but there is a growing interest in the possibility of liquid methane. Dr. Agnew, I'm, I'm curious uh, if you have some thoughts here uh, so far. Well, there's a lot of liquid methane on the Earth as well. At the bottom of our deepest oceans is kept very cold and under a lot of pressure, an ocean of liquid methane. Uh, methane is, in fact, consumed by lots of things, including algae, and uh, can be turned into carbon dioxide which uh, and water, which uh, can be used to fuel uh, sugar, making sugar, and uh, photosynthetic uh, activities. And that is, you know, CH3, or, which, is, uh, which is methane, uh, is is an organic compound at which you know with with a little bit of energy you get ethane and propane and alcohols and all kinds of things going and uh, you get the building blocks of life so methane yep. can certainly be used in respiration quite right and and in fact uh, dr. Agnew, I wonder if you can help my uh, my recollection uh, it's it's only on the order of a few months back that we had the uh, announcement, to, again, it was NASA-funded research, about uh, the, the life forms in, in one of the lakes here in the western part of the U.S. that were 